This video will contain some flashing lights, but I don't plan on pushing it too far. After what I do right here. <music> Greetings travelers. Did you miss me? Well, that's your own fault. I still make other videos. Final Fantasy XIV is too easy. Final Fantasy XIV is too hard. Ah, it's good to see nothing has changed in the last 200 years. I boot up the game, go into a leveling dungeon, and got a mentor healer that didn't DPS while struggling to keep everyone alive. It brings a nostalgic tear to my eye as I walk into every mechanic in a level 100 dungeon because I'm still just mediocre at the game. Some things never change, Traveler, but Samurai... Samurai also hasn't. Now before I do my amazingly moderate deep dive, we need to take a little bit of a history detour together. I know this will come as a shock, but Samurai was introduced in the Stormblood expansion, specifically as a DPS so old Final Fantasy players could complain that it wasn't a tank. That's why it has Third Eye, now called Tengetsu, to preserve one tank-like aspect of the job. In spite of these subset of complaints that have never gone away, most people were relatively happy with how Samurai played and doing big damage. Samurai was the sole selfish melee DPS, but now it shares that spot with Viper. I can't wait for both groups to argue over which job is statistically better. That's why I cleared the tier week 1 with a Viper co-melee as an early peace treaty and stole all of his gear drops. Not everything was perfect in the past because both Samurai and the other DPS introduced in that expansion are often accused of being complete jobs where there was no room to add anything in the future. This impossible task was undertaken by the designers, where I believe their thought process was quite simple. Samurai builds up Midari Setsugeka to do big damage in burst windows. What if they got to press a second Midari Setsugeka after the first one every minute? Thus. Tsubame Gaishi was added to the job in Shadowbringers. This little 60 second cooldown unaffected by skill speed is one of the single most controversial buttons ever added into Final Fantasy XIV. It was a long time ago, so many weren't around, but when Shadowbringers came out, samurai players threatened a revolution and began salting the farmlands. Many would end up quitting the game entirely, and some even stopped purchasing Dakimakuras, resulting in a severe economic crisis that we are still feeling the effects of to this day. This might sound similar to another samurai incident, because it is. There are three general schools of thought that form various cults around this button, and most of the nuance is a variation on the theme. The first group are the casual freestylers that build up Midares and wonder why the button doesn't line up with said Midares. They hated Tsubame Gaishi because the button made no goddamn sense. Then we have the loopers. The players who looked up a guide, learned how to line up Tsubame Gaishi, and then never learned how to adjust their rotation to account for anything going wrong ever. You've heard these players complain before. They're the people that scream about being forced to disconnect from the boss for half a second or forced downtime in a fight. Because learning a strictly rigid rotation on a dummy makes them a good player. They hated Tsubame Gaishi because accepting that they still had room to improve would go against that very concept. Finally, you have the Freestylers, who've always lined up their rotation to raid buffs ever since Samurai came out 1400 years ago. To them, they'd go, Tsubame Gaishi? Because in practice, the use of fillers, holding for buffs, and using Higenbana's dot timer to keep track of the rotation have been the way Samurai has been played since forever. What Tsubame Gaishi actually did was raise the skill floor of the job dramatically because you either knew how to line it up or you didn't. And if you didn't, that Tsubame Gaishi cooldown would stare at you like the scum of the earth for being slightly out of line. This resulted in players losing uses of a major cooldown over the course of an encounter, which is the biggest barrier to being mediocre at the game. But, if you did manage to line it up consistently, odds are, you were doing better than fine. Unsurprisingly, a lot of players detested Tsubame Gaishi, and they've constantly tried to make it more forgiving. In Endwalker, they gave it two stacks, which meant if a player was slightly late to pressing the button, at least the cooldown wouldn't drift further and further out of buffs, or result in the loss of an entire use over the course of a fight. 
This eliminated one side of the issue, but most samurai players were getting through their rotation too quickly and wondering what to do for 5 seconds because Tsubame Gaishi wasn't back up yet. If they tried to press any other button in that window, the Tsubame Gaishi would vanish into the ether. On Dawn Trail's release, they tied it to make Yoshisui's cooldown instead of it being its own thing. That way, it was always guaranteed to be up when samurai players used Makyo for their burst windows. But it felt a bit clunky because there are times where using Tsubame before Makyo was appropriate. Thus, that change ended up limiting the job's options when planning its rotations. Which finally results in where we are now, where they said, fuck it. Unlimited Tsubame Gaishi works. It always procs after every Midare, and it doesn't go away when pressing other combo actions. The shackles have finally been released and the job has been busted wide open. What I'm emphasizing with this pedantic history lesson is that in practice, nothing has ever truly changed on Samurai. If you wanted to be good, and you still want to be good, you had to, and still have to, line things up in buffs. What has changed is that Samurai is now way more accessible to casual-minded players. Because they don't have to understand what that statement I just said even means to use Tsubame Gaishi. For more hardcore-minded players, they still have to adjust their rotation on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to maximize DPS and improve their leaderboard number that determines their value as a human being. This is quite literally a win for everybody. Nobody has lost as a result of this change. It is so rare to make a job more accessible in this game and still keep the skill expression relatively high. This is one of the best changes made in Final Fantasy XIV, in my opinion. Just in case you need to be reminded that my opinion is objectively correct. I still liked Shadowbringer Samurai, but this is the closest Samurai has ever felt to its Stormblood origins, which is strangely short-lived compared to the rest of its history now. Because it's not about building a rotation around Tsubame Gaishi, it's about building a rotation around party buffs. Even if those were the same things in practice. To contradict everything I just said about skill floors and skill ceilings and how smart players have to be to be good at the game, I don't actually care about any of that shit. I lied. The real reason I like this change is the same reason I liked a certain other button. This is just fun. It's the most fun change Samurai has gotten in years. It could be the stupidest thing on the planet or even make the job do less overall damage. Who gives a shit when we get to drop atomic Tsubames out the wazoo? Alright, history lesson over. Time for the mediocre guide. A hardcore samurai player's gameplay looks like this. <laughs> Meanwhile, my gameplay looks like this. And who are you gonna trust more to teach you the ways of the blade? To get started on your spiritual journey, unlock the job in Old Dom, and remember that two-way tricot might be difficult to maintain, but that smoothness is 100% worth the effort. As per usual, I only make max level guides. If only, there was someone out there who made guides from level 1 to 100 with thorough explanations of how to play it at every major breakpoint. I can almost hear him in the background. Hello, I am Wes Galber. You may know me as that guy being heard in the background, or that guy who should take off the sunglasses. I make those guides that cover the entire gambit of samurai levels, with a Dawn Trail updated guide to be made when I feel like it. I'm not going to teach you how to be an expert and dirty parser, but I'll at least tell you why mashing buttons at random won't help you do much more than get blasted out of life. I can't promise you'll get the same sarcastic wit, or the same number of catgirls as you would with your chair-based senpai, but I can promise I'll only mock you for liking Kaiten twice. Okay, maybe three times, but I'll not go further than that. Starting with the basics. Samurai has six core rotational GCDs that break down into three combos that build up Sen, and a seventh GCD cast that spends them. Each Sen is a unique color, which doesn't mean anything for the Iaijutsu spender because it only cares about the quantity and not the quality of Sen. Instead, the job gauge is here so you don't accidentally use the same combo twice before cashing in. All combos start with Gyofu because it got a name change at level 92. Hitting that button is easy, but then Samurai has to make a three-sided choice. To facilitate that decision-making process, Samurai has two buffs that make it faster and stronger. A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, that statement actually meant something. The fact that these haven't been turned into traits remains an anomaly in Final Fantasy XIV. 
It's probably because it's so easy to manage, they forgot about it, but then remembered to remove Noxious Gas on Viper and Hutan on Ninja. In practice, this will never matter. Even at the slowest GCD speed possible, and deliberately cycling through every single other combo action before going back to one of the buffs, it still won't fall off. The only way this can matter is if there is a lot of downtime, in which case, consider refreshing the one with lower time remaining first by either using Shifu or Jinpu. What is relevant all the time is that the Kasha combo ends in a flank positional and the Gecko combo ends in a rear, while the Yuki Kaze combo has no positional requirements, gives no buffs, and is only two buttons instead of three. What combo you choose to use will largely depend on what Sen you already have, and which positional is easier to access in the coming moments, if at all. For those who don't understand positionals, when targeting an enemy, there's a nice little indicator that makes it obvious where the rear is located, as it's cut out of the back. The flanks are actually just as big as that on either side of the boss, despite not having a direct indicator like the rear. It can be nice to know every now and again where you can stand and still have it count, but 99% of the time, all melee DPS just stand around the back diagonal of this indicator for easy access to both. It's very telling if someone says hitting positionals back to back is super hard, because what they're really saying is that they're moving too far because they don't understand how it works. If the boss ever makes it impossible to hit positionals and you can't Yukikaze or EI Jutsu or use the first two combo GCDs of the other combos to stall for time, that's what True North is for. Or maybe the boss has a full circle indicator around them, which means they don't have positional requirements at all. Excellent. I can now explain what EI Jutsu does. This is a Samurai's quick draw technique with a cast time so short, I forget it's actually possible to interrupt it, turning the average player into a slide casting wizard. The move it changes into depends on the number of Sen currently lit up. For one Sen, Samurai can apply a 60 second damage over time effect to the boss with Higimbana. This is a highly advanced and intellectual mechanic. For 2 Sen, Samurai can use an AoE skill that would look a lot cooler if it was a cone with Tenka Goken. Finally, for 3 Sen, Samurai can unleash Midari Setsugeka to do a big ass hit on single target. After pressing either Tenka Goken or Midari Setsugeka, Samurai gains a Tsubami Gaishi ready buff that allows them to repeat that action with no cast time at any point in the next 30 seconds by pressing Tsubami Gaishi. You could use them back to back if you land that 3 frame window input, but the important facts are that EI Jutsu skills have a 6 Yalm range instead of the normal 3. For mechanics where you don't have to go too far from the boss but still need to maintain some distance, holding a bit on a Midari cast or saving a Tsubame can be very useful. If a Tsubame charge is already being held onto, using a regular EI Jutsu cast will override it. Except for Higenbana. Higenbana does not proc Tsubame Gaishi. That is kind of a lot of information, but it should be fairly obvious that applying Higenbana first-ish, then using Midari while it's ticking down, is the correct strategy for using Sen. Since Higenbana's dot only requires one Sen, if for some reason you needed to apply it raw, it would be best to use Yukikaze for that because it's more efficient but I am muddy in the waters with that because it's not typically how Samurai is played in practice, especially at max level. Back on track, every time Samurai uses a raw EI Jutsu skill with a cast time, they gain a meditation stack, which at three stacks can be used to press Shoha. This weave is a nuke on one target, but also a line AoE attack with fall off for trash pulls. For the sake of mediocrity, just mash that button as soon as it's ready, because using a raw EI Jutsu cast when you already have three stacks is very bad. It is possible to optimize this button more, but that would be better than being mediocre. Meditation stacks are just kinda there as part of the kit, but the real weaving resource on Samurai is Kenki. Kenki is earned by pressing GCDs that are not EI Jutsu. If you want to get technical, each combo gives 20 Kenki total, even if Yukikaze is only two buttons. This can be spent on Hisatsu Sene, which must be strictly pressed every minute after getting a trade at level 94. 
It is important to not dump all Kenki into Hisatsu Shinten so that you don't drift Sene as a consequence. It should be fairly obvious, but to optimize Kenki a bit, some is saved to land extra Shintens inside of 2 minute raid buffs. Speaking of 2 minute raid buffs, Iki Shoten is a 2 minute cooldown that isn't a buff. It will give 50 Kenki when pressed, and then allow Samurai to immediately dump all the Kenki it generates into Zanshin, which feels very stupid. But that's not all. Iki Shoten also lets Samurai use Ogi Namakiri within the next 30 seconds, which is basically a separate EI Jutsu button that can only be pressed after Iki Shoten and is completely isolated from everything else in the kit. Since Ogi's first cast has a cast time, it will generate a meditation stack. It also has its own Tsubame Gaishi follow-up built in by pressing the same button again. Similar to Shoha, both Zanshin and Oginamakiri are used in single target, but are also AoE attacks with falloff. The key difference is that they are shaped like cones, and not a line. After all that Kenki talk, Kenki is not just used for Shintens. It is also tied to Samurai's Gap Closer and Backstep. It's probably smart to save at least 10 if that's going to be important for a mechanic. I have continued to lie about the number of GCDs on Samurai because NP is a ranged attack. That can be used if it's not possible to hit the boss because it's too far for EI Jutsu. Backflipping will even enhance the next MP usage to make it shinier. Hisatsu Yaten's trajectory is determined by drawing a straight line through the center of your character and the center of the enemy that you are targeting. That is a nice nerdy thing to know, but I recommend propelling yourself horribly several times in a row and embarrassing yourself to get a better feel for it. NP also generates 10 Kenki, so you are guaranteed to have enough to gap close back in after pressing it. This is a cool little thing that Samurai can do for disconnect mechanics, however, it is a common pitfall for newer players to spam this where it isn't appropriate. If a mechanic can be resolved by standing at max melee range, or by using the extended reach of EI Jutsu, or by walking quickly in and out of range while keeping the GCD spinning, then using Hisatsu Yaten is bad. But, there is another small caveat here. Some extra safety gaming as you learn content isn't the worst thing on the planet. Greeting GCDs the way I just described is what you do after you've gotten a lot more comfortable with something and start to play around with it. The only kind of strange thing about Samurai's Gap Closer is that in terms of Kenki to potency, it does the same amount of damage as Shinten meaning it is possible to spam it and not lose any damage over the course of a fight, for some reason. The last Kenki related thing to mention is Tengetsu. Why is it called that? Because it gets you ten Kenki. If Samurai takes damage within 4 seconds of pressing it, it generates ten Kenki. In a perfect universe, it will be used right before every instance of unavoidable damage, but it is more of an optimization thing. The second most important optimization thing after crunching out as much uptime as possible. It can be procced by walking into the bad, assuming that it doesn't give you a damage down, but be nice to your healers. Don't soak avoidable damage to get 10 extra Kenki unless they give you explicit permission. Tengetsu also reduces damage for that one hit and gives a surprisingly decent regen on proc as well. Congratulations, you're now a master of meter. That's why we get to talk about the last core weaving tool. This one is arguably the most important. Makyo Shisui. The two and a half Kiseki fans in my audience are going absolutely nuts with all these references. Makyo Shisui is on a 55 second cooldown and holds up to two charges. Upon pressing it, Samurai gets three stacks that allows them to execute Kasha, Gekko, or Yukikaze as if the combo has been completed, giving them full potency and generating Sen, as well as giving the buffs from their respective combos, even though technically, those buttons are not the ones that generate Fuka and Fugetsu. This is why buff management doesn't really exist on Samurai, because this makes up the only gap in buff timing where it would have been relevant. It also makes it super easy to immediately buff up at the start of combat. Even though Shifu and Jinpu will light up after pressing Meikyo Shisui, that's just there to deceive you. It is literally useless. In the modern pursuit of readability on skills, 
For the love of God, can we stop making those buttons light up to confuse newer players? At level 100, Make Yoshisui also grants a buff that turns the next cast of Midari Setsugeka into Tendo Setsugeka, the single hardest hitting move in Samurai's kit. One part of this is a little confusing, so let me explain. You don't technically need to spend any of the Makyo stacks to create a Tendo. If you already have all three Sen built up and press Make Yoshisui, it will turn EI Jutsu from Midari Setsugeka into Tendo Setsugeka. Assuming any of that made sense, you now have the full toolkit to hit enemies and figure it out for yourself. There's a bit more I could talk about in general terms, but it's going to get messy. So, let's just go into an example opener and explain the finer details after. As per usual, this is just an example. As long as all the big damage moves land inside of party buffs, which usually come out 3 GCDs into combat, it kinda doesn't matter. Before the boss is pulled, Samurai will ideally use Make Yoshisui about 10 to 12 seconds before the battle starts. That isn't going to happen in most casual content, or when chain pulling, but that's okay, because this is to set up some tech for fights that go on for a long time. It is a good habit though, if you ever plan to optimize later down the line. Otherwise, just pre-pull Makyo in True North, and probably sprint to get in range as quickly as possible. Immediately start with Gecko to get the damage buff up first, then go into Roid Rage if you plan on using them. We are building a full set of Sen with Makyo first, so press Kasha, then weave Iki Shoten, then press Yuki Kaze, cast Tendo Setsugeka, and immediately Tsubame Gaishi follow up. After that, double weave Hisasu Sene, and make Yoshisui again. Press Gecko and weave Zanshin, then cast Higenbana with that one Sen. Now cast Oginamakiri, and its follow up instant cast on the same button. Then weave Shoha and press another Gecko. Weave Shinten while moving to the flank to press Kasha. Then simply press Gyofu, then Yukikaze, and weave another Shinten. Cast yet another Tendo Setsugeka and Tsubame Gaishi follow up. And assuming everything went smoothly, that last Tsubame Tendo will land inside of the pot window. From here, this is when things start to get a little freeform. I can't give an exact loop because it will vary depending on skill speed, but what I can provide are some basic tips and tricks. For filler, simply build up Madares at your leisure and cast them whenever you feel like it. As mentioned earlier, Holding on to a Madare cast for a couple of GCDs in the middle of a Kasha or Gecko combo can be nice for situations where utilizing that extended range is appropriate. Saving a Tsubame can also do the same thing. Kenki will obviously be generated during filler, so it's important not to overcap that by accident. I love pressing Shintens, and it's completely safe to do so if you have over 50. Now it's going to get a little bit scary, because Higenbana is going to keep ticking down and need to be refreshed at some point. The secret is to use Make Yoshisui to align burst windows around that Higenbana refresh. That might not make any sense because it is more of a feel thing, so let me give an example. At 2.14 GCD speed after getting the haste buff and full uptime, I have completed two Sen when Higenbana has about 12 seconds remaining. I then weave Makyo, complete my delicious chicken tendo, use it, Tsubame it, then get one Sen, and reapply Higenbana perfectly on time. And then I finish off my last Makyo stack with either Kasha or Gecko. I also make sure to press Sene around that window because I never drift cooldowns. That's a cool example, but it also won't always happen that way. If I don't get full uptime, I might only have one Sen and need to refresh Higenbana. I know it's a little crazy, but I press Makyo anyways and build a Tendo by spending two Makyo Shisui stacks. Then I get one more Sen and reapply Higenbana. It's completely flexible where Makyo Shisui is used. If I'm only slightly behind on the rotation and I have two Sen, I'll build up a Tendo, then get one Sen, then Higenbana, and then use my Tendo Tsubame Gaishi. Because Tsubame Gaishi doesn't need to be used immediately, and Higenbana doesn't override it. The big trick to bursting 
is that one of the Sen I have before I press Meikyo Shisui is hopefully always from Yuki Kaze. Because using Meikyo on Kasha and Gekko saves two combo GCDs instead of one. I operate on vibes and comfort which I can't exactly convey very well in video form because I'm too far gone. To cover all the bases though, I just mentioned refreshing Higambana with Meikyo on 2 Sen and 1 Sen. It's possible to already have all 3 Sen when needing to refresh Higambana. In that case, I press Meikyo right before that Midare to turn it into a Tendo, then gain a Sen to use Higambana and use the last 2 stacks on Kasha and Gekko in either order. That can feel a bit clunky, but if you press Meikyo after that Midare there, you'll just end up tendoing a little bit later. That's completely okay to do on odd minute burst windows because there's no buffs to worry about. But the early Meikyo tech right there is important for even minute windows with 3 Sen prepped. But what about no Sen? Well, if that happens, things have gone wrong. If you follow this framework, what will likely happen is that you will have 3 Sen, see Higanbana's time remaining, and end up bursting slightly early. If this situation ever arises, start panicking. Technically, it was appropriate to delay for a GCD or two by either randomly using a backflip and MP, or by using a Yukikaze combo and eating the Sen before you had all three of them because you knew this exact situation would happen. On odd minutes though, where the Tendo timings don't matter, there's a lot of flexible options to accommodate that specific situation. Perhaps doing a raw Yukikaze combo Higenbana refresh. Now Traveler, is it really a big deal if you weave Meikyo a little early and maybe land the first cast of Tendo before raid buffs come out, or drift Higenbana a smidge, or refresh it a little early? or overcap Kenki when trying to ensure that Iki Shoten doesn't drift outside of buffs. No. If you are conscious of these concepts and work towards improving them, you're already on a path to become a master of the 8 leaves 1 blade school of sword techniques, and better than 99% of the general Final Fantasy XIV population. It's like you're on a cruise ship. Some of these other players are struggling on a lifeboat and I pray for them and I'm not even religious. It doesn't need to be an exact science. Getting burst windows close enough is all you need to be mediocre. Higanbana tracking is nice, but slight drifts will make it harder and harder to understand where you are in the current timeline. Technically, Sene is on a strict minute timer, and that can be a little bit better for keeping track of how often 60 seconds have passed. These are helpful tricks when learning a fight. As you play a specific fight more and more times over, the mechanics are going to line up at the same spot all the time, and much of the rotational nuance will start to become more clear for that specific encounter. Eventually, it all truly becomes ingrained in your body, and you know exactly when buffs are supposed to be coming out. After talking all about vibes, if you do want an exact science on how to line everything up, there's a really nice graphic on the balance where they use the time remaining on Higimbana after the last Madare cast to plan out when to use Meikyo Shisui. So go to the link if you think that resource will be useful. Veteran samurai players are probably going to ask a very specific question, which is, are fillers still necessary? In full uptime, because of how many Tsubames are being pressed? Not really. There's not technically a need to plan on using something like a Yukikaze combo and eating the Sen with Hagakure. Instead of the rotation being completed too fast, if anything, most players are going to find it too slow, and needing to press Meikyo slightly earlier than they're used to, to adjust for downtime. But, fillers can still help realign things if something goes wrong, or because downtime really is just that extended. Hagakure can still be used to eat up all Sen if getting the job back up after downtime while holding on to 1 or 2 Sen is really scary, or if you're trying to dump everything before the boss dies. I'm already talking about stuff more advanced than I usually do, but we're what? Almost 30 minutes in at this point? You've got nothing better to listen to. Because Tsubame Gaishi can be held onto, you cannot use it right away and wait for 2 minute buffs to come out before pressing it. Just don't screw up and cast a Tendo first before using that held Tsubame and lose a cast because you're me. This holding technique can also be done with Shoha, 
by waiting and using it right before the first cast in an even minute burst window. With the use of a Tendo, a Higenbana, and an Ogi, the second Shoha can also be landed in buffs because while it's a 15 second cooldown, all raid buffs are now 20. This works as long as a Shoha can be fully prepped without the risk of overcapping. If stacks are lost because of downtime, or gained because of downtime with meditation, it won't always line up this way. The last thing to keep in mind optimization wise is to save as much Kanki as possible and dump it as quickly as possible to press Ikishoten early enough into raid buffs that Oginamakiri and Zashin land in that window. It's totally not stressful at all because Shinten and Sene together spend 50 Kanki and it will line up perfectly because you've never drifted Sene. For the last little advanced tidbit that I casually mentioned in the opener, we like to burst around minutes in Final Fantasy XIV, but Make Yoshisui is a 55 second cooldown. This doesn't mean too much because we ignore it most of the time, but every minute, it gets 5 seconds closer to overcapping. That means we would gain a second use of it if the fight goes on for 12 minutes. Which most don't. But, that is what the big pre-pull timer on Meikyo is for. It makes it come back faster, so that in theory, 6-ish minutes into the fight, during another pot window, Samurai can casually press another Meikyo Shisui and land a couple more tendies inside that pot window. This is a pretty cool tech for anyone who's interested in it, but if you play the game more casually, and still burst every minute, it is possible that a fight goes on long enough, and you realize that you have an extra Make Yoshi Sweet Charge all of a sudden. That is completely normal, you didn't do anything wrong. Just use a Yukikaze combo, and build up a Tendo to dump the extra charge. It's not a big deal. This 55 second cooldown is a small holdover from the good old days, and so Samurai doesn't feel awful at low levels. The last trick with Makyo is to make sure you use all charges before the boss dies if that will happen before the next burst window, because you don't want to miss a use of those delicious tendies. With that, that's everything that you need to succeed, except for extra utility buttons. Whenever there is downtime, and the boss is not targetable, simply stressfully stand still to try and track the server ticks and gain some extra kanki and some extra meditation stacks. Gaining a full Shoha usage with Meditate is a pretty big deal. Faint is useful for reducing raid-wide damage even if it's not physical. That extra 5% can be a difference maker. But they are putting more physical raid-wide damage in fights these days. So, shake hands with your co-melee as you override each other's debuffs. Second Wind and Bloodbath are nice self-sustained tools when you need them, especially when paired with that nifty Tengetsu regen proc. Finally, Arm's Length can be used to negate most knockback effects in the game. If that doesn't work, simply gap close in the middle of getting pushed around to cancel the animation. I've never fucked that one up before. Arm's Length is also technically a tank cooldown in dungeons, but that is more of a tank thing, and I feel like I'm forgetting something. Samurai AoE is extremely easy. Simply press the two button Fuko and Mangetsu combos to get your buffs. Tenka Goken is the go-to EI Jutsu for trash pulls, and will also proc unlimited Tsubame Gaishi works. It also gets enhanced by Meikyo Shisui in the same way as Madari Setsugeka to turn it into Tendo Goken, which can be the hardest hitting AoE move if it manages to crit. Ikishoten is still good to use because Oginamakiri and Zanshin are high damage cleaves and not just for single target. When you move out to land those cleaves, it might be a good idea to try to use Shoha there as well, because it's a line. Same with Hisatsu Gurren that's a gain on 2 over Sene. I like to have a couple of different AoE shapes to keep dungeon pulls from getting too stale. Kinda wish we got more of that. Finally, Hisatsu Kyuten is a gain on 3 over Shinten. That's about it. That first trash pack might melt when you unleash Ogi and Zanshin and the second one probably won't die as fast. With that, you have everything you need to succeed. Wait, Cher. When is using Higenbana again over using Midari Setsugeka? Oh my god, you really want to know that? The answer is very complicated. If Higenbana can tick for its full duration, it's definitely better than Midari Setsugeka. In the past, the breakpoint was it ticking for 45 seconds to do more damage than a single Midari. 
but that ignores the new Tsubame Gaishi changes. If you try to math it out right now, it almost seems like Higimbana is bad in terms of damage, but keep in mind, it only takes one Sen to use Higimbana compared to the three to use Midare, which is why the button is still good. In something like ultimate fights where there can be phases with a lot of force downtime, skipping Higimbana is usually fine or favorable for those phases. But it still depends on a lot of factors. If reapplying that last Higimbana loses you a use of a Madare, doesn't grant an extra use of Shoha, and doesn't get to tick for super long, it's probably bad. Here is the definitive answer. Who fucking gives a shit? Just let it rip. In conclusion, Nippon Steel. I like the Tsubame Samurai changes. I like current Dawn Trail Samurai as of current patch that they hopefully won't make any dramatic changes to in the coming patches because I am not remaking this guide mid-expansion. However, the part of the job that feels more obnoxious as more time passes is Iki Shoten. The reason it's so annoying is that when saving Kenki for burst, it can be kind of hard to dump everything fast enough to not waste what Iki Shoten generates. Yeah, we can dump 50 by double weaving Shinten and Sene, but we also get 10 to 20 back again when pressing Kashas and Gekkos and potentially proccing Tengetsu. Ever since Oginamikiri was added, it puts more and more pressure to dump Kenki faster and not drift Ogi as a result. The reason it wasn't bad when Ogi was first introduced to the game is because Samurai had a little other button that could help them easily dump Kenki. They're never putting that back in the game, by the way. Not unless they remove the guaranteed crits on Midare, which would be fine with me. Thankfully, Zanshin, being a 50 Kenki spender, is great because it makes it a lot easier to dump a bunch of Kenki quickly on a single button. After using Iki Shoten. When I first had the button shoved into my face, I thought they were gonna go full circle and just condense Sene and Gurren into one button because we used to only have Gurren. But no, it's this extra weave that nullifies the Kenki generation of Iki Shoten and puts even more pressure on weaving it as soon as possible. Personally, what would feel good with this iteration of Samurai is making Sene cost 50 Kenki again. Yeah, it used to be that way in the past, and the reason why it was made lower was to accommodate pressing three chitons in the opener. And then they removed chiton. Why is it still 25? Because they forgot. Especially with those buttons being a minute cooldown now, it would make pooling Kanki feel a lot more meaningful and a lot more rewarding. The only thing they would have to change to accommodate that is reduce the cost on Zanshin. I don't know what I'm talking about though, I'm just a chair. It's just a suggestion, and if they think this current version of Kenki management is the fun way to play the game, then I hope they can at least stick to their principles. Now let's get out there and practice those perfect judgment cut timings. It's more of a feel thing. Update segment alert, update segment alert. Alright, here's the deal. Nobody likes hearing me complain, nobody likes a billion channel announcements. I just want everyone to be on the same page and make some things clear. I will not be making guides for every job in Dawn Trail. I didn't in Endwalker, so it is precedented. I may or may not make more if I feel like it. It is very likely that Viper and Pictomancer videos will be made over the next two and a half years, but I am not going to make any promises because I'm not sure if I can keep them. I'm not a primarily Final Fantasy XIV focused channel anymore, and if that is what you want, I'm sorry, we aren't compatible anymore, it's not you, it's me, blah blah blah, I've been cheating on you with Devil May Cry. We have already been over this a billion times before, I just don't want to deceive you. I want to continue making Final Fantasy XIV videos whenever I feel like it. Is that probably a bad business decision in the long term? Yes. Misshapen Chair? Making videos and bad business decisions? What is the sun gonna rise tomorrow? You want my bland blanket thoughts on the MSQ this time around that are super controversial and crazy? I put that in the update segment at the end of my Valhalla video, which I will paraphrase the rest of here but not that part, so you're encouraged to attempt to watch it. Silver play button, channel check mark, sub goal, I'm not that stupid.
Most of my audience consists of people who want Final Fantasy XIV content. It's why I don't really feel like I earned this plaque, blah blah blah. I don't have anything planned for this milestone, but I do want to turn ideas over to my fellow travelers. Specifically the Final Fantasy XIV ones, because you're the ones who got me over this milestone in the first place. Don't ask for a face reveal, it already exists. Here's me in a bad vanilla cosplay, and I assure you, the wig is there to cover up my thinning hairline. Thanks for listening, leave your suggestions in the comments down below. Keep in mind, I do refuse to show up on camera again, and I will obviously reject any ideas I am not personally comfortable with. Special thanks to Wes Galber for agreeing to make my shoutouts more effective. That's youtube.com slash at Wes Galber. And as always, thanks to my patrons who continue to help me out and technically get perks as a reward. Hope those colors on my Discord server go a long way.